Tyson, what are we talking about today? Oh my god, Richie, I'm literally sweating. This is what happens when I have notes and I have to talk. This is not normal behavior. Okay, we can do this. You know what? We can do this. We can start over. We can pretend that your bullying did not happen. You did not derail this podcast because we're starting now. You ready? Yeah. Me, 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 me. Okay, good. Me, me, me. (laughs) Okay. Hi, Richie. (laughs) Hi, Sin. Hi, everyone. And welcome to episode one of... I didn't think of a title for yeah, this wasn't, one. It was, wasn't episode one before at all. You've just decided this. No, no, I, I didn't just decide it. It was always episode one. I just forgot to say it before. But I didn't think of a title for this specific um, mini podcast. So you want to do episode one of a series that's just talking about the the like less than three minute intro of no, Demon's Souls? It's, no, no, th- this episode is intro. But then look, I have I have a thing for everyone. This episode is intro. Our next episode is episode two, the Nexus. Then it's episode three, the Monumentals, and then there's. You didn't tell me any of this. You just said you wanted <laughs> to talk about the intro. Yeah, but that was episode one. I was like, Richie, you know I get nervous when I have to talk. <laughs> I'm like a Soulsborne game. You have to put the information together as it's coming at you, okay? This was more like Dark Souls 3, where parts of the information had been deleted. It was consequently impossible to make sense of. <laughs> oh my god. So what this intro we're going through now is DLC. <laughs> oh my god. So, Richie. Yes, sir. In previous podcasts, you mentioned that Bloodborne seemed like it started out as a Demon Soul sequel before becoming its own thing. That's right, Sin. <laughs> and in later podcasts, we talked about things that the data mining community uncovered that point in that direction as well. Yes, including a document that just says it's Demon Souls 2, which <laughs> is the main giveaway. Thank you, Richie. And we'll actually touch more upon that in future Bloodborne podcasts. But today, <laughs> we're going to talk about something a little different. Mm-hmm. No, so, we're not! <laughs> yes, we are! <laughs> we're talking about Bloodborne! We're talking about parallels between Demon Souls and Bloodborne. Alright, alright. The Demon Souls intro starts with the narrator telling us that, by channeling the power of souls, King Alan the Twelfth brought unprecedented prosperity to the kingdom of Balataria. So here, King Alan is doing some weird souls magic to achieve prosperity in his kingdom, and this makes me think of Bergenworth and the Healing Church, um, as well as some other places slash civilizations in Bloodborne. Where they're doing like weird arcane slash blood slash umbilical cord slash meditation slash rituals to achieve enlightenment. Would you say that Yanam really has unprecedented prosperity though? <laughs> well, no, it's it's different in the sense that King Alan wants prosperity, but like Bergenworth wants enlightenment. And they're trying to achieve it with like strange rituals or whatever. I think this is more like what happened in Thumaru, though. Yeah, that's why I mentioned the civilizations as well. Yeah, yeah. 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 Could you elaborate on that? You're saying this is more like what happened in Thumaru? Something people say about Bloodborne that makes it feel different to the other Souls games is that in the other Souls games, there tends to have been some sort of hideous catastrophe prior to you showing up. And then the game is set in the aftermath of that. Whereas in Bloodborne, the catastrophe is mounting throughout and then it happens, like basically at the end of Act 2. And you you witness the Red Moon descend and everything get destroyed. Whereas, like, if you think about, like, Dark Souls or Demon Souls or something, like, you start in the ruins after all the bad things have happened. Right. Right. Like, in this one, you start, like, after Boletaria has fallen and King Alant is just presiding over the ruins. You don't King see Alan. Boletaria. King Alan. Thank you. Aha. Uh-huh. You don't... <laughs> you don't see, like, it doesn't start with Boletaria, like, 
if this were structured like Bloodborne, it would almost be like Alant would be trying to wake up the old one throughout, and then he would, and then Volatari would be destroyed, and then you'd mm-hmm. play out like a bit more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Richie. So the intro continues, and the narrator tells us that it was all good in Bellataria until the colorless deep fog swept across the land. So let me ask you, do you think the deep fog can be compared to the plague? Um, I don't think, really. I think the, the, the main thing about the fog is that it cuts off Volataria. Like, it's like Volatari gets encircled by this thing and you can only get in and out through this fissure in the fog. Like, that's that's the in-game justification for fog walls. Yeah. Which all the other subsequent games use with no explanation. They're just there. <laughs> mm-hmm. But here it's like, no, this the fog, like, when the fog blanketed this place, you couldn't get in or out anymore. It's, like, contained within it. It's more like, and it's more like, you know, being stuck in the dreamlands or something. So the fog itself is not a hostile entity. The fog is, it's like, well, I don't know if fog, fog can be hostile. It's literally, it's fog. But it's like the, when okay. you start messing with the old one, the fog blankets the land. Okay. Yeah. You and know then, what? Yeah. I will, I'll erase that. I, yeah, you're right. It's like in the Simpsons movie when they drop the big dome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Richie. Thank you, Sin. And then the narrator says, Boletario was cut off from the outside world, and those who dared penetrate the deep fog never returned. So, you know how in Bloodborne, um, Yarnum is very isolated and wary of outsiders? Yeah. But they don't have fog around them. No, you just can't get out. I mean... I don't even know if it's necessary necessarily true that you can't get out of Yarnum because like No no, I don't think you can't get out of Yarnum. I'm just thinking yeah. like I guess it's a sort of parallel where like Balitari is surrounded by the fog that doesn't yeah. really let you go yeah. in and out or whatever. But Yarnum yeah. is so isolated, like they don't like anybody coming in, and you probably won't leave because you'll probably be eaten by a werewolf. Yeah. But you know what in Bloodborne is surrounded by fog, and once you're there, you can't leave. The nightmares. Yes. Because all the all the Dreamlands locations fade off into fog. They're all just like castles and islands and things in seas of fog, and you can't. I don't know if you have trouble. You you can leave fine because you're bound to the dream, but like other people seem to be trapped there. That's that's why like when the DLC revealed that the the masts in the hamlet. The masts in the frontier were from the Hamlet. I was actually kind of like, "Oh, that's a bit. That's a bit too literal." Because <laughs> I, I liked the idea of the 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 wrecked ships in the nightmare because it just had this this um it just put this imagery of like things have run aground here. That it's just like somewhere you get lost and you can never escape. You just sort of drift forever. Mm-hmm. You are very good at Bloodborne, Richie. I'm a doctor. <laughs> Thank you, Richie. I played Bloodborne. <laughs> That's hard though, I stop. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Peelbeam. <laughs> You're funny. <laughs> um <laughs> Okay. So the Demon Souls intro uh, tells us that Valorfax of the Royal Twin Fangs broke free from the fog and told the world of Boletaria's plight. So yes. here we have someone who's actively telling people about what's going on in Boletaria, right? Yeah, he's he's trying to get people to come and like save them. But you have a different idea about what happened in Bloodborne. Well, yeah, but what what did you think happened in Bloodborne? Oh, well, I thought that somebody came to Yarnum and they're like, oh my god, check out this awesome blood. And then they left and they were just telling everybody, like, look, there's really cool blood in Yarnum. <laughs> Everything's great. They cure disease. There's a healing church. It's going to help everyone. You imagined it differently. 
<laughs> well, no, but like I don't know if it doesn't specify how we found out. Mm-hmm. But like I, I always thought it more like a secret because Yarnum's all like they hate outsiders and they're always like away with you, away with you, away with you. Mm-hmm. And if you look at like the the way Yarnum's constructed, there's like all those aqueducts and boats and things. Mm-hmm. So I imagined like. And also, like, it's, this is confusing, because if you stand on Upper Cathedral Ward and look out, it looks like it's on the coast. Right. And I thought, oh, that is that deliberate, and then I realised, I don't know how deliberate that is, because what's happening is the game just renders everything beyond a certain distance as water. Mm-hmm. So that's, they didn't, it wasn't like in, um, like in Demon Souls, when you're in Boletari, you can look out and you can actually see they've by hand modelled the area surrounding it, the villages and everything. Mm-hmm. Um. But if you if you accept that like Yarnum is coastal, then my my interpretation was like Yarnum is just a port city mm-hmm. where people were stopping. Although confusingly, it's described as being in the mountains. So I guess it's like <laughs> mm-hmm. it's a mountain that's around sea level. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when you walk around the streets, you see all these discarded things, and they're they tend to be things like suitcases and stuff. It's like people are like coming and going. Mm-hmm. So my take on Yarnum is it was like a very, very isolated place, but it was somewhere people had to keep stopping. Mm-hmm. So I was saying it's like, and like, I presume it must have traded and that's why it has like mm-hmm. dry docks and aqueducts and stuff. Cause it was like trading with the outside world and it was maybe trading blood in return or something like that. But, um, it seems very, very secretive. And mm-hmm. it, it doesn't seem like they would say, yes, yes, everyone come to Yarnum. Because when you get there, they're all shouting, away with you, away! And they're, like, <laughs> chasing you out of town with torches. But then that is further complicated by the fact that this is after the Plague of the Beast happens. Mm-hmm. So, like, it's not actually clear how much of, like, that violent xenophobia was there initially. But, like... It's clearly been that way for a while, and our character has travelled there. So my take on it was just that there's this weird, isolated town, and people, you hear rumours about it. Mm-hmm. You hear that, like, oh, yeah, like, the, I, I heard there was a place that might be able... Like, if we accept that our character had a sickness, which I think is, like, that's how I interpret it. It's like, we're sick, and we went to Yarnum. But, like, we had some incurable disease, and we were just, like, searching around, and we were sort of desperate, and we started hearing about, oh, well, you know, I hear that if you, if no one else can heal you, there's this place in the mountains, and our character was, like, hiking through the mountains for, like, months, going to all these little villages like Hamwick that were saying, oh, yes, over in the distance, you know, if you, like, go that way, and then, like, they'd run into a traveler who would say, yes, there's a place over there, and we would very gradually make it there. Because, like, the point about about Yarnum is it's really secretive and really enclosed. So it's I don't think it's like someone actually ran out and said, we need help with this hunt thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Richie. So when we were talking earlier, you also mentioned how because it's this gothic setting, uh, yeah. everything seems, like, secretive. And um, yeah, yeah. can you reiterate that again? What I was saying before is it it was kind of like um like in like in Dracula or something like a Dracula movie when they they like Harker shows up at the tavern and he's like does anyone know about Castle Dracula and like everything falls silent and then mm-hmm. like they leave and then was like oh are you her in the mountains <laughs> or something like <laughs> <laughs> many an urban few return <laughs> yeah Romania is Somerset apparently what. Some people will get that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Richie. <laughs> Back to the Demon Souls intro. We learn that King Alan aroused the Old One, the great beast beyond the Nexus, from his eternal slumber, and that a colorless fog had swept in, unleashing terrible demons. Yeah. So. So, in, in that yeah. sense, the fog is sort of like the Plague of Beasts, like you were saying. Oh, like I was because, saying, but that part is yeah. going to be cut out because you shut that down. You shut that down so quick, Richie. You were like, sin, you idiot. I don't think I said that. Thank you, Richie. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess that's what I was thinking about when um, earlier I was asking you if the fog is the equivalent of the plague. Well, this this part sort of is. that like. You, 
he un- he wakes up the old one and then the fog comes and the demons kind of come out of the fog. Mm-hmm. But like, so yeah, like there's a plague kind of, but it's not. So I guess I was right. As- I guess I was right. I guess the fog is the equivalent of the plague because the plague releases the beasthood and the fog releases mm-hmm. the demons. I guess, yeah. Thank you, Richie. <laughs> <laughs> I just imagine you with like your finger raised your head going back and forth. Well, actually, and the fog releases the deep. <laughs> there are some other elements in this sentence that make me think of Bloodborne. Go on. So in Bloodborne, we know that the Thumerians are guarding the slumbering Great Ones. Yeah. And we also know that Great Ones are like are like sympathetic in spirit and like answer when called upon. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, when I first played Demon Souls, uh, when I saw the Nexus, um, I thought it was like the Hunter's Dream. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so like basically, King Alan contacting the Great One from beyond the Nexus reminds me of Lawrence contacting the Moon Presence and creating the Hunter's Dream. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Richie. <laughs> do you think like? Because the the um the old one is very much like the great ones in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that the place that you meet the old one is like that's the cut coastline boss arena. So presume they may, were maybe going to tie it back together a bit more like that. What? Because like the place where you meet the old one in Demon Souls, it's that boss arena. Is that the cut boss arena? Sorry, from the dungeons. It's th- it's the cut one from the dungeons. Okay, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and um, like I think we talked about this a bit before, but when you meet the old one in Demon Souls, it's underground. Mm-hmm. Like it, you fall through the bottom of the nexus and you land on a beach that's like. It's the same thing. It's like if that was in the chalices, you would go down. You would go underground, and there would be a beach underground, which is the same like set up because that explains a lot because we were like wait a second why is there a beach underground when we <laughs> first saw it because we, we were thinking is this the orphan of causes arena like an early version and they've just stuck it in the chalices for testing it and then gradually when we were putting it together we're like oh wait a minute because the beach in demon souls is also underground that kind of makes sense yeah okay okay so the beach being underground makes sense but if you take an elevator into an active volcano that doesn't make sense i feel like if if it was played the same way it might if like (laughs) you this is the difference it's like in the in demon souls the bottom of the nexus shatters and you like fall down into this sort of cloudy misty void and then you awaken on the beach and it's sort of like almost like a dream Mm mm-hmm um, if if <laughs> the maiden in black had said the old one is awake now and then an elevator <laughs> <laughs> be there and then you took the elevator down and then the elevator, <laughs> even though you were going down, went up out of the bottom <laughs> of the beach. <laughs> and then you turned around and there was no elevator shaft. It would be like that. (laughs) Thank you, Richie. So the second part of that sentence that says unleashing terrible demons can be compared to the beast plague, right? Because the beast plague creates uh, demonic creatures out of people, basically. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now back to the Demon Souls intro. We are told that the demons hunt down men and claim their souls. Yeah. So this can be literal, where it's like, uh, the beasts of Yarnum are murdering people, and so, like, claiming their souls. Um, but also it could be metaphorical, because you know how there's this beast called, like, um, beast-possessed soul? Yeah. So it's, like, a metaphor like that. I, I guess. Thank you, Richie. I feel like the difference, though, is that in um, in Demon Souls, like you consume the souls, the souls make you more powerful, and like your character gradually becomes a demon throughout playing it. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like 
blood drunkenness, except in... Uh-huh. I don't know if, like... <sighs> no, Rich, you're right. That's exactly like blood drunkenness. I'm thinking, like, outside of the hunters that use the, um... That specifically decide like they used blood to make themselves stronger. The regular people of Yarnum who are turning, it, with them it's just like a hunger, and then when they become beasts they stay as a beast. It's just like they snap, mm. it's not. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of the same, but also not the same. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Richie. So then the narrator says, Those who lose their souls also lose their minds. The mad attack the sane and chaos reigns. Yeah. You know what that made me think of? The um, the fox in Antichrist. What? It's a film called Antichrist where a fox says chaos reigns. No. Okay. (laughs) Wait, the fox said that? Yeah. What does the fox say? Chaos reigns. Oh no! That's a spooky fox! That's a dead fox. What? I don't know about this Antichrist movie, Richie. I don't know about that. Yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't recommend watching it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um. So what it actually makes me think of is Jura. You know how Jura is like, oh, <laughs> what? What's, what's funny? Oh no, continue. What's funny, continue. bully? <laughs> Why spe- don't, don't tell me why specifically okay. Jura? Specifically Jura, because Jura is like, oh, those beasts mean us no harm. So maybe what Jura is really trying to say is that people who transform may not be in the best shape cognitively, and they're just not thinking clearly at that moment, and normally they would not harm you. So I feel like that sentence, those who lose their souls, lose their minds, the mad attack, the sane, and chaos reigns, is explaining Jura's motivation. Yeah. Yeah. You know how, like, the people in Demon Souls attack you and they're like the hollows? Mm-hmm. They're called the soul-starved, and the idea is that they're still alive, but their soul, as in the thing that's, like, making them human, is being taken away from them. So it's kind of like becoming a zombie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what is the equivalent in Bloodborne? Well, you could say that a beast is kind of the equivalent because you lose your reason. That's what I just said. That's yeah, what I yeah. just said Jura is telling you. Yeah, okay. I'm like staring. I just realized I'm like staring down the microphone, but you can't <laughs> see me. <laughs> So then uh, the narrator in the Demon Souls intro informs us that Bellarfax spoke of the enticing power of the demon souls. Each time a demon claims a human soul, the demon's own soul is invigorated with the life force. And the power of a mature demon soul is beyond human imagination. Yeah. So that made me think of uh, Mikolash. When he's like, you know, grant us eyes, grant us eyes. He was, like, pretty impressed with enlightenment. So, I guess... <laughs> like, you know, in Demon Souls, it's all about, like, being this cool giant demon. But in Bloodborne, it's, like, about being this, like, galaxy brain? Yeah. I'm not sure I understand my own parallel, Richie. Could you explain it to me? <laughs> I think the the most um, bloodborne like character in Demon Souls is Freak. How so? Because Freak is a he's like a sage character who's trying to understand the secrets of the universe. Uh huh. And they actually do an interesting thing with him that we we spoke to Loki about, and it was kind of lost in translation because it talks about Freak's like dirty clothing, and what they actually mean by the dirty clothing thing is that it's the uniform of someone who was a priest, mm-hmm. but has now renounced being a priest, so they're like it's their clothing has become stained and become something else. Okay. So the idea behind Freak is he's. He was a priest who was worshipping what they just call God in the game. 
And then he started to realize that the real secret of creation lay in the old one, lay in sorcery and soul arts. And he started looking into that. And I mean, the big like reveal at the end of Demon Souls is that God is the old one, that like the, the priests and the mystics have actually been like dealing with the same entity from two different sides and not realizing it. But, um, and what, what Freak does is throughout the, he actually has like an arc throughout the game where he gets gradually, it's like, like the original Mikolash layout, well, the original Mikolash um, structure where he would gradually go madder and kind of like Logan in um, Dark Souls, where he starts off like doing research and the more, the further you progress in the game, the more he learns and the more unhinged he becomes. And that ends with, at the very end of the game, he actually, he's the one that says, kill the maiden in black. Like, she'll Aww. she'll be vulnerable, then kill her and take her soul. Like, he's begging you to do it. Um, so, Freak, Freak is the most, like, Mikolash slash Willem slash Lawrence-like character in, in Demon's Souls. Awesome. Thank you, Richie. Then the narrator says, the legend spread quickly. Mighty warriors were drawn to their cursed land, but none have returned. Bjor of the Twin Fangs, Yurid the Silent Chief, Sage Urbane, Skurver the Wanderer, the Six Saint Astraea and her knight Garl of Inland, Sage Freak the Visionary. And I guess the equivalent of that would be like Gilbert or Yamamura coming to Yarnum. Just chilling there a little bit and never leaving. Would you describe any of them as chilling? Mm, you know. Just chilling in my nightmare prison. <laughs> Just chilling. Repeating my- the same poem over and over again. Yes. Longing for death. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't even attack you, right? No. So that's chill. Gilbert doesn't fight you. That's chill. Yes, he does. He jumps out of a window and tries to kill you. Okay, but that's like after. After he's annoyed with you, like, spawning under his lamp all the time, waking him up in the middle of the night. You don't make that much noise when you spawn in, though. Okay, but then you make noise when you kill everyone around there. I imagine that noise is probably there regardless, though. (laughs) Okay, thank you, Richie. Back to the Demon Souls intro. We also learn that the colorless deep fog slowly creeps beyond Belataria's borders. Humankind faces a slow and steady extinction. The deep fog will eventually swallow all lands near and far. Yeah. And I guess, like, uh, in Bloodborne, you know how we talked about the cyclical nature of things? Like, yeah. what happened in East, happened in Lauren, happened in Thumaru, happening in Yarnum? Yeah. So I guess the plague, the old blood, all that stuff is just slowly bringing extinction to various yeah. civilizations. No, and you can see it's, it starts to spread outside of Yana, because that's what's happening in for- Forbidden Woods. Right, yeah. Because the healing church are deliberately like making the plague spread so they can keep studying it. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Thank you, Richie. And then the narrator says, But Boletaria has one final hope. A lone warrior who has braved the baneful fog. Has the land found its savior? Or have the demons found a new slave? Um, in terms of Bloodborne, this makes me think of the pact Lawrence has with the Moon Presence. Right. Where, like, you know how German is held as collateral? Yeah. And if the player character chooses the Yarnum Sunrise ending, German will remain a slave of the Moon Presence. But if the player defeats yeah. German but does not consume the three chords, then the player becomes the new slave of the Moon Presence. But yeah. if the player consumes the three chords and defeats the Moon Presence, they become the savior of humanity and lift humanity into its next childhood. Okay, okay this is something I was going to say about the last thing we read but it also applies to this the big difference here is that like you didn't come to yarnum as like the champion Mm -hmm. you just came to yarnum and got caught up in the events and you're trying to survive Mm -hmm. whereas the characters and it it, it, that's also kind of true of dark souls where you're just like some dude who got the undead curse but Uh you're not actively yeah whereas in demon souls it's like 
you're someone who it doesn't it leaves your characters like motivation up to you but you're someone who very specifically went to Boletaria because you know about like the fissure and everything yeah so you kind of know what you're getting into but whether that's like whether you're you think your character is like there to rescue people or they're there to learn about soul arts or they're just like out to get in a fight that's up to you <laughs> although there's that confusing thing where your character seems to know what pale blood is before the game starts i think it also depends because you know um you can pick your character class or whatever and yeah, each one has yeah and each one has a little story that can maybe yeah. change your character's motivation yeah a bit. yeah yeah but I, I think like the difference is that in bloodborne i think it's pretty clear that we don't know about the exact like we don't know how bad things are in Yarnum mm -hmm. when we arrive whereas in Demon Souls it's like you kind of you're it's like you're an adventurer going on an adventure to this place you know is hostile yeah that's true that's very true yeah cool thank you Richie that's a very good point so before this point the intro of Demon Souls is illustrated with like pictures um, and then there's a message that pops up saying, would you like to play the journey to the Nexus? This is going to be like Death Stranding where we go over every single I knew, I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that. Can, can I say <laughs> the one thing about the intro that always sat weirdly with me? What? Is that it's presented as like a flashback, right? Uh-huh. And then toward the end... It's seriously got this like old film filter applied to it, where there's like <laughs> flecks of dust on the film, and like it's out of rack and sort of jumping. And I'm like, <laughs> did they? Is it, it's it's not a flashback to like the 1930s. It's flashback to like the fucking 14th century. They. <laughs> Thank you, do that. <laughs> you know how there's this Saturday Night Live skit where the guy's like, it needs more cowbell. <laughs> so somebody was like, it needs more flashbacks. So they added more filters. <laughs> okay, so, uh, <laughs> so after that message, um, that message is weird, though. Would you like to play the journey to the Nexus? Why is it weird? What, what does it mean, would you like to play the journey to the Nexus? Because Explain when you start the game, uh -huh. right, there's the tutorial level where you're running through and at the end yeah. you get punched in the face by Vanguard and or the Dragon God, depending yeah. on how you play it, right. Um, if On subsequent playthroughs, either when you're in New Game Plus or if you've already done it, oh. you can just skip directly to the next. <laughs> okay. It's like if... Um, like a tutorial like if, or something, yeah, I get it's it. It's like if Dark Souls had an option to just start at Fire okay. without the Richie, Asylum. It's quiet. that. So I will ask you again. <laughs> Continue, Sid. So, Richie, could you kindly yes. tell me what the message would you like to play the journey to the Nexus means? It means that when you first play Demon's Souls for the very first time, you have to run through that tutorial area where, like, it's like this map that you never go back to and you actually can't die in it until the boss. Mm -hmm. And um, at the end of that, you die and you get sent to the Nexus. And what's happening is it's just as a convenience thing saying, hey, the next time you start the game, whether it's like a new character or a new game plus or something, you don't have to do that because it was just a tutorial and you must know what you're doing now. Uh -huh. But um, some, sometimes you maybe do want to play that because it's like if you started again, um, you might want to fight Vanguard again. You might think like, I can do it this time because uh -huh. if you beat Vanguard in the tutorial, you get a bunch of upgrade materials. And you get to meet yeah. Dragon God. Excellent. Thank you, Richie. So now, uh, as opposed to having flashback 1930 filters, pictures yeah. footage, yeah. we have game footage. Oh. Dateline Bolivarian, 1930. <laughs> Thank you, Richie. Um, so the next scene starts with a warrior walking through the fog in this gray place. 
basically they're trying to traverse the fog to get to Boletaria, right? Yes, this what they're doing. Yes. And then we hear a child's voice say, Brave soul who fears not death, I shall guide you so that you may lull the old one back into slumber. Yeah. Um, we'll later find out that this child is known as a monumental. Yeah. And we'll talk about that more in like future podcasts. Okay. So after the monumental says, I shall guide you, we see this portal open in the fog, like to yeah. guide the warrior into Boletaria, like out yeah, of the that's fog. The fissure. Yeah. 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 Thank you. And so this makes me think of the Bloodborne's intro cutscene. Um, because toward the end of that cutscene, we see messengers crawling all over the player. Yeah. And we hear the doll's voice say, ah, you found yourself a hunter. Yeah. Like, the messengers themselves are pretty mysterious, but later in the game, the doll describes them as if they're children. They're childlike, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, like... It's not, like, 100% clear, but it feels like the messengers may actually be, like, the ones guiding you to the hunter's dream after your death. I'm pretty sure that's what's happening, yeah. But, like, regardless, they guide you throughout the game with their notes and the merchandise and all that. Yeah. Yeah. And basically, I think, like, the messengers could probably be compared to the Monumental in that way. Really? Yeah. But the... D- d- in terms of the intro. But in terms of the intro, the doll's more like the Monumental. I well, think. no, it's more like a combination, you know? Okay. Because, like... You know how, before the game starts, uh, in Demon Souls, the last thing you hear is, like, the Monumental telling you they're gonna guide you? Yeah, but, like, yeah. in Bloodborne, the last thing you hear is the doll telling you, ah, oh, you found yourself a hunter. And then yeah. the last thing you see is the messengers, like, crawling all over you. Yeah. So that's why I think there's sort of, like, a parallel between the two. Yeah, but it's it's like I was saying, the, the difference is that the monumental's like, oh, you're a brave slayer of demons. Of course, like, you will lull the old one back to slumber. Whereas in Bloodborne, you just you were on uh, an operating table, and then you just had this like weird fever dream. Yeah, but I'm talking about the messengers specifically. I'm pretty sure if we understood yeah. the messengers, they'd be like, "Hey, you're so cool! You're such a brave warrior! We're gonna give you a hug," you know? Yeah. 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 So I think the monumentals are basically like the messengers, and the doll would be like the maiden in black, you know? Yeah. Yeah, but the the difference is the monumentals like they are the ones who are in charge of everything. We don't know that yet because we're just doing the intro or two. Or but like the next thing that would happen is the <laughs> monumental explaining all of this. It's that in the intro that's in the game. We're not there yet. We're in the intro or two. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Richie. Broadcast from space <laughs> has reached us. <laughs> What wisdom do the aliens have to share with us? You're a bitch. <laughs> oh, okay, so about the fog. You know, um, earlier we talked about how in Demon Souls the fog is clearly related to the actual lore. Yeah. But in Bloodborne, um, it acts more like a classic souls barrier. Yeah. However, in Bloodborne's Alpha, the fog had messengers in it. It did, yeah. Yeah. So so maybe at some point the fog was something more? Yeah, probably was. And it, it's still called like the nightmare fog in the game. Mm-hmm. And the nightmares are still surrounded by fog, so it's almost like, you know, like when you enter a boss fight, it's like the nightmare is descending around it or something like that, and you can't leave until you make it go away. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Cool. Thank you, Richie. That's about it for the intro. Do you have any final thoughts on what we discussed today? Well, no, because you won't let me talk about other stuff that happens I'm only allowed to talk about up to the character wandering into the tutorial area. Yes. Yeah. I think we we pretty much covered it. There was an almost exact um, 20 minutes, 20 to 1 ratio, actually, of discussion to trailer. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. It's a three-minute intro. We talked for an hour. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Richie. Um, well, if that's it, Richie, do the outro. That was... You didn't tell me what it was until later. <laughs> we don't have a name for it yet, but it's episode one. Episode one of... The Atlanta Falcons. Say that again? The Atlanta Falcons. <laughs> what does that mean? It's from The Simpsons when they didn't know who was going to be playing in the Super Bowl. Aww. So this really awkward bit where Lenny is like, let's watch the Super Bowl. I wonder who's playing. It's the... And then he holds the this mug of beer over his mouth and you just hear this really awkward, The Atlanta Falcons. <laughs> Leave that part out. <laughs>